Hi, I'm Lee. Welcome to the channel. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the channel before, um, I run this channel with my son, Ollie, and we've been covering the Meng Wanzhou case since pretty much the start. Um, we cover a variety of things, technology and some political stuff. And there's been some new evidence in the last few days that's um, come to light in the case. And I have um, two people here. Um, I have um, Chris Skinner, who's a expert from the banking and fintech field. And I have Richard Curland, who's a lawyer and he's in Canada at the moment. So I'll let them introduce um, themselves. So first to you, Chris. Yeah, hi, Lee. Um, thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm welcome. flying around Europe, uh, based in Poland and Britain. And mm -hmm. I've been following the Mengwa Zhao chase for quite some time now. Um, very aware of what's happening and how HSBC has been brought into this political football game, which um, we'll talk about it more, but it is a, a game. Mm -hmm. And um, Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, You're welcome. I'm Vancouver based in Canada. Um, I'm uh, an immigration lawyer and policy analyst. Uh, I assist uh, occasionally uh, governments, foreign and domestic, with uh, immigration uh, policy issues. Um, what else can I say? Uh, I uh, have provided advice to um, many of Canada's immigration ministers, as well as Her Majesty's loyal official opposition in the Canadian parliamentary system. Uh, as well, I help... Um, um, other departments like uh, the Office of the Auditor General of Canada. I'm an old China hand. <laughs> and uh, okay. there you go. Yeah, that's great. So for those of you who don't know, I'll just give a little bit of background of the case. So back on December the 1st, 2018, um, Meng Wenzhou, who's the CE, CFO of uh, Huawei, um, she was on a flight, I believe, to Latin America, and she was transiting through Vancouver Airport. And as she was transiting through Vancouver Airport, she was arrested um, by the Canadian, the Canadian authorities on behalf of a um, warrant that was issued by the uh, USA. And the charges against her are bank fraud and um, wire fraud or conspiracy and or conspiracy to commit bank and wire fraud. And the case has been going on for about two years now in the uh, Vancouver court, the court of British Columbia. And this last few days, there's some new evidence um, come to light. Now, a lot of the... Um, evidence that was presented by the US was based on the fact that um, she hadn't made the HSBC bank aware of the relationship between Huawei and Skycom. Now, Skycom was a subsidiary that was doing business in Iran. Um, so there's, there's two sort of pillars to this. One was that um, she was said to have misled um, executives at HSBC Bank. And the second pillar was that um, the sort of arrest warrant claimed that only junior uh, members of staff at HSBC Bank were aware of the situation with Huawei's account. Now, the new evidence that's come to light um, completely throws that out of the water. Um, the uh, Huawei went to court in Hong Kong and forced through, through that court hearing, uh, HSBC were forced to release a lot of internal documents, emails and documents from an internal management um, reporting system um, they have. And those documents showed that there was um, senior management. In fact, what one of those employee number seven was a managing director um, at HSBC. And the information, the emails and the internal reporting system showed that executives were well aware of Huawei's business, Huawei's relationship with Skycom. And also that four risk assessment reports have been signed off by employee seven. So first of all, I'd like to go to Chris 
um, and see what he thinks about that and see what he has to comment about that. So, Chris. Well, there's a number of factors in here and we'll start with fact number one, which is if you are dealing with an Asian client as a Western company, you never assign junior people to the account you assign the people to the account that are at the same level as the people meeting you from the company you're dealing with. As a cultural thing, that's an Asian thing. You'll be very familiar. So there's no way in which um, HSBC would deal with Huawei with someone who's junior to meet the deputy chair CFO. That is completely sure. ridiculous. Sure. And that's one, that's one of the things the, Amer the USA claims. And I uh -huh. think the documents we now have from HSBC verify that that was not the case. Yeah, we have Alan Jones, who is the head of Asia Pacific uh, for banking um, with HSBC, who was orchestrating the meeting and the events as the main person. Um, but equally, HSBC would obviously be looking at the company in the context of the round. And... Huawei is one of their key clients. It's one of their top 20 clients. That's right. Around this, they're dealing with Skycom, which is in Iran, which is um, banned by America for sanctions, which means that they have to work out how to deal with one of their biggest clients in a situation where there are sanctions applied from a US uh, or, or organization. What were the links? And the key part of this is the question is that they were dealing with Skycom transactions through their New York office in US dollars. <laughs> and that's the only link between Weiwei, Skycom and HSBC and the USA. And that's what they're accusing Meng Wajou of being the, the key facilitator of those transactions. Uh -huh. Am I correct in saying that they didn't have to clear those um, funds through that, that route? Could they have chosen a different route? Are you, are you aware if that, that's the case or not? They could have chosen a different route, but actually in the context of the financial system, it's very difficult because the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And sure. therefore, typically everything that is cleared internationally eventually flows through the US offices. The US banks, Swift. yeah. And, and uh -huh. Swift, Swift is the network that connects everyone. Um, and if, if you're not aware, they're based in Belgium. So what you actually mm -hmm. have is Belgium, China, Iran, USA, Canada, you know, all these countries linked together in a financial system that's integrated through New York. And, and that's uh -huh. where things got hung up. Okay, okay. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, the main sort of um, thrust of the warrant was that um, Mung, Miss Mung had, had misled um, HSBC. So, Richard, do you feel that the um, warrant still stands up now this new evidence has come to light? Well, we have to take one or two steps back. Uh -huh. Follow the money. Always follow the money. What's <laughs> going on with HSBC in the United States? They were on a deferred prosecution agreement. In other words, they were essentially on parole. If they made a misstep, their authority, their license to engage in banking operations on American soil, gone. And uh, HSBC uh, was dealing with Iran in violation of U.S. sanctions. And mm -hmm. so you're the bank. What do you do? So strategically, HSBC wisely, to their benefit and their credit, doubled up on lobbyists. I tracked the money paid for Washington lobbyists who engaged at the United States Department of Justice in Washington. And here's mm -hmm. the thing, the outcome is that HSBC, HSBC provided the evidence to the Department of Justice in the form of a PowerPoint presentation taken at a tea house in Hong Kong. 
and claim the high ground saying we, 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 we didn't know what was going on. We were duped by this lady, this company. Uh, so uh, sorry, but if uh, we violated something, it's not our fault. Mm-hmm. Bottom line, they kicked the time ball forward. There can't be a prosecution given that defense in any short period of time. So that's the backdrop. The outcome was uh, in Canada, uh, America knocked on the door asking uh, to uh, have Canada sign off on an extradition case. Uh The warrant that you were discussing earlier is uh, a warrant for arrest. Uh, It was quietly issued, silent. And when Ms. Mung intended her travel destination, Mexico, uh, in transiting through Vancouver, uh, she exposed herself to uh, the impact of that warrant. She was facing Mm -hmm. arrest. Uh, So that's the backdrop. What do you have to do and say and give to Canada to have Canada agree to undertake an extradition case? Well, Uh, there's a statement, a summary of facts. And that's the problem. The summary of facts, as you correctly pointed out, uh, in part appears uh, on the arrest warrant and certainly appears on the little certificate signed off by Mm -hmm. a minister to kick the extradition case going. Well, there were factual inaccuracies. As as, uh, suggested earlier, a statement that uh, you know junior employees may have known, but that's it. That was completely undone in court last week by mm-hmm. new evidence from Hong Kong, the HSBC uh, case there, uh, and uh, no surprise to anyone in, in in the Vancouver courtroom. Turns out, <laughs> it wasn't junior executives or employees; it was the senior key people. But here's Uh the problem. I'll let you go on with questions for just to bring us up to speed now. In the the, the technical problem is this. And the judge, I was sitting in the courtroom, the judge pointed out what happened. This case basically morphed. We were talking two and a half, almost three years ago about an Iranian sanctions issue. But after it came to light that Canada has (laughs) Iranian sanctions, we moved the goalposts to fraud. And fraud only has two things. And I'll be quite quick. (laughs) Uh Uh, There is um, loss and deceit. And loss here is the international reputation of the bank. If it becomes known the bank is dealing in in Iranian sanctions contrary to American law, our international reputation is besmirched. And Chris Uh probably certainly knows the track history of HSBC with over a billion dollar in fines and penalties paid for fraud, violating anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing, banking laws, you name it, and dealing with countries like uh, Myanmar, Sudan, and other uh, (laughs) similar situated countries. International reputation means what exactly? In terms of deceit, that was key, gone, off the table after last week, because you can't have deceit when you know. So there you sure, go. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, um, um, everything up to the warrant. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I find it incredible because, you know, um, HSBC, um, Huawei was one of their largest customers. Now, you know, I'm pretty sure that if you have one of your largest customers, it's not going to be dealt with by junior employees. It's going to be at the top level, you know, the, the, the senior people, as, as Chris pointed out, and also you've got the Asian thing where they won't put a junior person looking after a senior exec at, a, at an Asian company, you know. So I, I, I do think that. And, and am I right in saying that um, HSBC were fined about $1.9 billion for some misconduct they, they did a few years back? Am, am I correct in saying that, um, Chris? Yeah, you are. And um, in fact, I was going to build on what Richard said because – This is the key part of the backdrop to what's been happening, which is that HSBC had a $1.9 billion fine for uh, allowing money corridors to operate between Mexico and the rest of the world uh, in 2011. 
and the uh -huh. US Department of Justice clamped down on the bank and said, you know, not only will, are you fined, but um, you, know, you have to observe that you, you will not do this again and you won't allow any operations that are uh, in the American sanction space again. And if you do, then we will shut you down uh, from a US perspective. And obviously, because of the importance of the US dollar as the reserve of the currency of the world, if you're shut down uh, and you can't operate in, in the main currency of the world, you have an issue. So um, HSBC signed up to the sanctions agreement and said, you know, we will not get involved in any further operations that infringe upon American policy. And the challenge in that is obviously, and this is the political football, you know, the uh -huh. challenge between America and China and other countries. And so Iran is a country that obviously America wants to shut down in the financial system uh, and uh -huh. has done for many years because of the potential for the threat of uh, nuclear, um, you know, bombs or other uh, issues coming out of Iran. Um if they're off the financial network and blocked from access to the financial network, that makes America feel more safe. But in China, Iran has no sanctions. You know, Iran does not have a problem with China. It sure. has a problem with America. And so this is where HSBC has got caught out. And they signed up for this Department of Justice agreement in 2011 when they got fined $1.9 billion. And yet uh -huh. now... Um, they have been caught out um, because the Chinese company that they bank, uh, that's one of their biggest clients, um, is dealing with Iran. And, you know, it's like a chess game. And I, I, I blogged about this the other day because um, the Deputy Chair Meng Wanzhou, Chief Financial Officer's daughter of the founder of um, Huawei, uh -huh. and she's the one that got caught in Canada because she has a, a house there. Um, and she's now locked down at home in between all of these political maneuvers and this game of chess between China, America, HSBC and Huawei. And it's it's a weird situation. I've not seen anything like it before. I don't know if Richard, you have, but th this is a new thing for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that um, this is kind of a case that sets a precedent because I, th I think... This is not a very common occurrence where they will. They will often fine a company. Um, they won't often arrest members of that company. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the deal. Um, you, you don't go after the body. You go after the wallet. And mm -hmm. so you, you, if there's some transgression, it's a, it's a corporate transgression. You don't get personal. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the case uh, rather unique. You do go personal if uh, the corporation essentially is uh, a one-person show. Sure. So you'll go for both, but not uh, a, a, a company the size of Huawei. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And enter President Trump. See, in the former American administration, uh, there were negotiations, ongoing trade, uh, uh, and other things between uh, Washington, Beijing, as well as Washington, Ottawa. Uh, so when this high profile case came to light, uh, the, the president uh, decided to engage uh, a chess game <laughs> and use Ms. Meng as a trade pawn. Uh -huh. I have never seen in Canada, ever, uh, an American president weighed in uh, to a current extradition case uh, uh, that has no precedent. So uh, U.S. asked uh, Canada for a favor uh, in executing uh, that arrest warrant and engaging the extradition process in the first place, and then went hip deep to um, maximize uh, the bargaining or negotiations mm -hmm. strength, and Canada, frankly, was scared. Canada was in the position of negotiating a kind of free trade uh, scenario again. And President Trump, I don't know if you're aware of this, 
can be unpredictable. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> so if Canada says no, there will be uh, consequences uh, that can't be measured. Uh, and that was the backdrop. The good news, there's President Biden. And here's a little uh, tip for you. I'm not sure if uh -huh. everyone's aware, but um, the vice president of the United States grew up in Montreal. She oh. went to high school here uh, in my hometown. Her, her mom was teaching at McGill University, and then uh, she obviously left for the United States. But she understands Canada, and she understands this case. And for HSBC, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the tipping point is not last week in court. It's on May 26, some few weeks ago, where it was publicly reported that HSBC is pulling up stakes in the United States. They're terminating oh, their American banking operations, except for their high net worth client base. Ah. So, ah, and uh, the first order of business when President Biden met with Prime Minister Trudeau, as is the case with every new uh, uh, president of the United States, mm -hmm. they decided that this case, uh, the Huawei case, is in the top 10 issues. No secret that um, eight to 12 weeks later, we're seeing uh, what I'm looking at as a shutdown process. And mm -hmm. I quickly, law in Canada, e Extradition Act, Section 23, gives the minister the authority, the power to shut down an extradition matter at any time for any reason. It's the only statute, rule of law thing, the rule of law says a minister can do this. You can't do this in a criminal case. But politically, there is a magic bullet that can be used to terminate an extradition proceeding. This new information that came to light last week, along with other significant disclosures of fact uh, in court, would allow mm -hmm. a Canadian minister today to say, I was not aware of all of this. And had I been aware of all of this in the beginning, we never would have proceeded. So let's shut this down and, and save it for everyone. So that's the content uh -huh. for today. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and so basically, you you think now the, the extras, because there was some talk that um, this, this new evidence should be for the, the case after she's extradited, if she's extradited. But to me, it seems that the whole extradition was based on this sort of um, false evidence, which has now turned up to be completely bullshit, uh, for want of a better word. So do you think the extradition should be now null and void, the, the extradition case? Do you think it should be thrown out? Well, it, it, it depends who you're asking. Really, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of a minister, uh, we are in uh, pre-election mode federally in Canada. In, in a few months, uh, people will be at the national polls. So uh -huh. it's no longer the minister's office that will pull this uh, cord. It, it's got to be the prime minister's office. So if you ask the prime minister, they will say, hmm, do I want that photo op? at Vancouver International Airport, where I handshake with the two detained, previously detained Michaels. Yeah, Wouldn't that's an interesting a nice one. Election shot. But if you ask the minister uh, uh, of uh, justice or attorney general, same person, uh, they will say, no, we, we, if I make a decision, I'm responsible. The uh -huh. court has a process. If I do nothing and the court throws it out, everyone wins because I've made no decision. So uh, in court, that's the person, it's the judge that's tasked with making a decision, not just on all the points we've raised so far, but on several others that involve our constitution, our charter of rights and freedoms. And um, Ms. Mung has successfully um, uh, demonstrated, as far as I'm concerned, violations, egregious violations of our Canadian charter. Uh, so it, it's a question of mm -hmm. time. Uh, I used to say, what's going to end first, COVID or the Huawei case? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and in Canada, I think it's going to be a, a close finish here. Yeah, I think I think it is. I mean, um, it's been going on for over two years now, hasn't it? I think. Yeah, it's almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a long, long time. 
And I think, okay, I think so what I'm... you guys are raising is layers of uh, issues. Um, so on the one hand, you have the issues of business. On the other hand, you have the issues of politics. And what Richard is talking about is primarily the issues of politics, which is the political football that she represents in Canada between China and America and Iran and other trade relations. On the other side is the issue of uh, a bank which is trying to walk the line and uh, kind of failing but trying <laughs> and i think that's that's the big question and you're yeah. right and, and if anyone likes netflix netflix did a documentary on hsbc as the banker to the mexican drug cartel oh, okay yeah. so yeah. i'm just saying uh this has got sexy written all over it i i assist um, uh, investigative journalists um, at, at Canada's national uh, level, uh, print and electronic. And I can assure you this particular case has the attention of all of Canada. But I can tell you, if you put HSBC to one side, you could take any bank, Citibank, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, you name them. They all have the same issue, which is walking the line. And the line is basically, can you stay within the regulatory regime of the major authority that you deal with, which in the banks I've just named is the USA. Uh, and that's who they have to try and walk the line within. And if they step outside that line, they're gonna get slapped down. And HSBC doesn't walk the line between America. It walks the line between the world. And that's their problem. <laughs> that's it, exactly. <laughs> and after, after this case, um, Chris, do you think that, um, HSBC will be trusted by, by large clients in the future? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, again, when I was talking about the Weiwei case, um, I've said that they've dumped their major top 20 client. And if, if, if it was me as an individual, that's not a big deal. But when it's their, one of their biggest corporate clients in the world and they've just said, oh, it's, you know, whatever, <laughs> threw them under the bus kind of thing they've thrown them under the bus yeah and you kind of go i don't think that's good behavior i don't know what that will do for their other clients but i don't think it does their reputation a great deal of good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on that richard <laughs> i don't care about it <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to light my hair on fire for that particular company, that group of companies, given their track record. They're not exactly building a better planet here. Let's face it. Certainly not. No, 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 no. And so let's get on to what, what do we think the um, real geopolitical intention was here of um, this case that was brought against um Manguenjo. What what do we think? What why why did they target her? Was the real reason fraud, or do we think it was something else? Well, let's roll back. Um, because I've been dealing with America and China for many, many years. I'm sure maybe you have as well, Richard, uh, and Lee. Um, but if you roll back, um, the real issue goes back to the 1990s as China opened up to the rest of the world and started to create um, world trade, dealing with the World Trade Organization and signing up to the agreements for world trade and opening the borders. And now we have a country that 20, 25 years ago was significant but not major, that is actually mm -hmm. the biggest world economy. Um, some would you know, debate that question, but I would claim it is today the biggest world economy. And the USA doesn't like that for obvious reasons. Um, and then layer on top of that, that we have um, the US dollar as the reserve currency of the world, which I mentioned before, but it may not be in the next few years. It might be a digital one or it might even be a cryptocurrency. Um, so dealing with a new world order and dominance of trade coming from China as a country or Asia as a region is a huge issue for the USA. And that's the real background to this case. It's the uh, resistance of the American economy under Donald Trump, because that's when this started, to yep. 
the emergence of Asia as a global force. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of see it that um, the US were really gunning for Huawei. Huawei had technology. I, I visited their campus in Dongguan and they just at that one campus alone, they have 30,000 R&D engineers and they have PhDs in physics, chemistry, mathematics, engineering. They have a big bunch of smart people there. And we were talking to one of the guys and he says they're currently developing stuff that we won't see for the next six to 10 years. You know, the, the 5G was sort of put to bed two or three years ago. And I think the US took their eye off the ball a little bit. And all of a sudden, Huawei was there with this technology that the US hadn't got, i.e. 5G. And they were they were the leaders in that technology. Only other sort of players in, in the park were sort of Nokia and Ericsson, both European companies. And I think America went into to panic mode. You know, they've, they've issued sanctions against them. They won't let a lot of companies supply to them. And I feel that the the kidnapping, let's say, of uh, Meng Wenzhou was another sort of string in their bow to try and hobble Huawei as much as possible. Um, that, that's sort of my thought on it. Well, I, I, I get the part company with two great minds here for a moment anyway. <laughs> um, and it's not because I'm an American citizen as well. Uh, my my mom's <laughs> first uh, postings were in the uh, United States Embassy system in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, but um, no, this is not a geopolitical plan. Uh, this was not a concerted effort. It certainly wasn't a kidnapping because uh, under operation of law, uh, there's a detention. Uh, so <laughs> um, it was circumstance. Uh, remember, it's a question of opportunity, serendipity. There was no uh, plan to uh, design a judicial case uh, implicating Huawei and Ms. Meng uh, to further American foreign policy. No, this is an HSBC-driven exercise. Uh, okay. Uh, and the lobbyists did their job. HSBC got out of uh, an immediate uh, problem and kicked the ball down the time road. Uh, and so uh, once that case uh, was engaged uh, in the judicial system and became publicly high profile, then the analysts in Washington looked at the opportunity and said, okay, what can we get from this? And that's when things happened. So the genesis is not American foreign policy or the American political system or competition between America and China. The genesis is a bank trying to save its skin, creating a court case that got high profile and subsequently the uh, opportunity arose for politicians and departments and captains of industry uh, to maximize the um, advantage. So in my observation of this case, Richard, I haven't heard that before. You're saying that HSBC was the whistleblower. Yeah, they're the ones who provided the evidence. They're the ones who um, made the deferred prosecution agreement and were in violation. And, and the they, were do, they were doing that because of the threat of the Department of Justice. Uh, yeah, well, it's their own parole agreement that they signed and they had violated it. So unless they did this, They'd be out of business in the United States, but um, as of uh, last May, <laughs> that's that's going to be the result anyway. So I'm going to have to go and investigate. But where'd you get that view from? Um, well, uh, I, I did I did the heavy lifting, so you can find out um, using the normal investigative means on um, um, open channels to see who paid whom for what lobby services <laughs> at the Department of Justice in Washington, yeah. and then. Uh, because I'm sitting in court all the time for this case for all this time, uh, the sources of evidence is disclosed in the Canadian courtroom. And every time the source runs back to HSBC, HSBC provided the American law enforcement authorities with the evidence and the allegations. 
So uh, it's it's pretty black and white at this juncture. Oh, that's really interesting. That because I my my money would have been on that. Um, it was the uh, the American Department of Justice colluding with HSBC. So it's interesting you bring the um, an opposite view. Yeah, that's uh, quite an Follow interesting the money. point. Follow the money. Uh huh. Mm, okay. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is how, what do you think um, the impact of this case will have on um, global relationships between Canada, China, and the US? Let's go with Chris to start with. I mean, from my side, um, and I mentioned it before, it's not so much the relationship between Canada, America and China, it's more to do with HSBC, because that's why I focus uh, the, mm -hmm. the financial. I did say that they've thrown one of their biggest customers under the bus and Rich has just, um, you know, endorsed that with a big. Yes, yeah. Um, more than I expected. Um, and I think <laughs> the, the issue is, um, you know, it's global relations. It's not just HSBC. It's to do with you know, we in the 2000s had this amazing imagination of a world that would be integrated globally uh, and HSBC was going to be the world's local bank. And now in the 2020s, we're going back to fragmentation and mm -hmm. division. And I think that's the issue we have to deal with this decade, which is how do we deal with a, a, a global economy that's no longer working as it should um you know we need to have global banks we need to have global trade and we need to have global integration but we don't have it anymore um unless you look at alternative systems like cryptocurrencies and alternative ways of doing things and that's what's interesting with china you know that the chinese go um, government's activities in um central bank digital currencies you know that starts to lead us into another world that maybe actually undermines the whole idea of having banks. Yeah, That's I mean, it's, it's re really interesting. The, the Chinese are very, very far down the road with that. Um, it's been tested very far. in yeah. five or six cities already here. Um, and I think I think it was Russia, actually, who even said they, they would consider not settling um, trade in, in US dollars um, as a nod to maybe settling in either their own digital currency or the, the Chinese digital currency. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's really, really interesting. Now, Richard, I was under the impression that before this whole um, Meng Wenzhou case, that China and Canada had a pretty good relationship and that's kind of soured a little bit over this. Do you think that once this case is um, settled, um, finalized, um, and I'm pretty sure that that Miss Mung will be released um, and not extradited to the US. I mean, I, I find it unbelievable how that could happen, considering the new evidence that that's come up. Do you think China-Canada relations will get back to what they were before? Or do you think there's always going to be this sort of mistrust um, among those two now? Oh, no, no. Um, my concern is Ms. Meng's health. Um, mm -hmm. um, I don't take it for granted that she's going home with her, uh, given her health record, there's a day-to-day -day risk. Uh, and it's a serious concern on my part. Um, now, geopolitically, I, I'm coming back to COVID. <laughs> I think there's a uh -huh. lesson here. Uh, there's uh, an outcome is a diversification of supply chains. Uh, not all eggs in the China basket anymore. That's a uh, bad economic design. So that's a positive outcome um, uh, for um, global economic stability. Uh, and that cookie cutters, uh, not just with China, uh, that same methodology will be applied to all the, let's not put all our eggs in one basket anymore. Sure. And uh, between um, uh, Beijing and Washington, uh, as well as uh, Ottawa, we are now uh, de facto in rapprochement. There's no other way of looking at this. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone wants trade. 
um, decades of uh, analysis uh, definitively demonstrates that you can create more capital, provide more per capita benefits for population by increasing trade. Uh, so let's increase trade. Um, the immediate outcome, uh, I suspect, uh, uh, between China and Canada will be a uh, very interesting order of goods and services uh, by China from Canada. Uh, and uh, similarly, um, Canada and uh, Washington, we are always best buds. Even when there's an occasional blip on the radar, let's say, uh, still best buds. Uh, and uh, the current uh, uh, American president and our current prime minister um, are getting along, uh, speaking <laughs> the same language. Uh, so I only see good things happening. And if you're one of those uh, day traders, keep your powder dry, <laughs> because after <laughs> this case is done, uh, imagine the increase in trade in goods and services will uh, result in higher demand for commodities of all kinds uh, over the next year. Uh, so I, I only see good things uh, uh, resulting from a positive outcome uh, by the termination of the uh, extradition case in Canada. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think we, we should start off. So what, what do you think, what, what's going to happen next? What, what's the, the, the next proceedings in the court, uh, Richard? Mm. Well, in the court, uh, it's August. Uh, not far away, we're July. Uh, and in August, around mid-August, uh, the court may hand down reasons uh, in... Um, a motion or motions presented by the defense. And two things can result. Uh, one, possibly um, termination of the proceedings. If there has mm -hmm. been uh, an egregious violation of the charter or some kind of due process. And secondly, new evidence. If it turns out that a court says this particular thing was wrong, Let's oversimplify. Now what? Canadian media is going to go, this is a railway track here. We know how this is going to go. We know the destination given this court ruling. Why, oh, why are you prolonging this one more day? Minister, uh -huh. you have seen the new evidence. You've seen the rulings. Surely you know the outcome. And every day you do not make a decision is a day that you have two detained Canadians remaining in China. It's on your head now. And sure. August is pre-election, like very close to the voting day. And there you have it. I mean, at that point, it would behoove the political minister to uh, terminate proceedings based on their internal polling. Yes, I do it. No, I don't do it. And I suspect mm -hmm. those internal pollings are going to want to see uh, this case gone faster than COVID <laughs> for political reasons. Yeah, I think I think once once it's finalised and once um, if once Meng is released, then I'm pretty sure the two Michaels will be released and things can start to resume normality. So, what what's your sort of closing comments, Chris? What do you think is going to happen? Well, um, I agree with what Richard just said. And mm -hmm. I think what is going to be interesting is from my perspective, after August and after the final negotiations, this whole thing will fizzle away into nothing. Um, I don't think that anything will happen with the extradition order. I don't think that Meng Wanzhou will end up in America. I think the two Michaels will be released from China, I think a lot of what's happened is purely the manu political maneuvering over law orders and views between HSBC and um, the Department of Justice. And what you have to bear in mind as I say that is that that means that for three years, three people's lives have been ruined. You know, and, and, and that is what I personally take away from this, which is, you know, you can talk about political games and political chess and maneuverings 
uh, which is what all this has been. But in the middle of this is the two Michaels in China and Meng Wanzhou in, in, in um, Canada. And I just feel very sorry for the individuals caught in the maelstrom of political maneuvering. Yeah, I think I'd second that as well. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to believe, like you've just said, that uh, Miss Meng would be extradited to the USA now, especially in light of this, this new evidence. It's, it's plainly obvious that HSBC were well aware of the relationship. It's pretty obvious that senior executives at the bank knew. And uh, so that, that's my take. Is, is there anything either of you two would like to add before we wrap up? Well, it, it's just, um, it's the families as well. I've been discussing yeah, uh, yeah. with, on all sides, uh, the ripple effects of uh, family devastation, stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, PTSD. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, a horrible price to be paid. And uh, the outcome is, is not fantastic for China in future because um, what it has accomplished is uh, making uh, fuel uh, to create an association of like-minded countries, Canada, US, you have some Western European countries to form an association to prevent China from um, um, arresting uh, citizens willy-nilly. Uh, uh -huh. And so that kind of backfired on China in, in the medium term and the long term. Uh, but um, I'm positive uh, that uh, the termination of, of the case will yield uh, results at the personal level, the company level, the industry level, uh, the national economy level, as well as the geopolitical economic level. For the same reason, when you pull a splinter out of your cheek, <laughs> you can concentrate on other things and get the job yes, done. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think my final comment would be, it does raise the question around what is the future role of global trade and how it's going to operate? And what is the future role of a bank that claims to be a global bank? Um, because if a bank's going to throw customers under the bus at the first opportunity, um, I kind of don't respect that bank. Yeah, me, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me um, today. It's really, really appreciated. Um, I'd like to hear your comments down in the comments section below. See what you think. You've, you've heard some quite differing views here. And I appreciate you all for tuning in today. But for as always, for now, take care. Would you like to say goodbye? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank Thanks very much. <laughs>